Um, the animality, blackness, and non-human by um, Francesco Asano, who's an undergraduate at the Brooklyn College. Uh, Francesco, oh, I'm going to butcher this, I'm sorry. Asano. Yugira Asano is an Asian American student and activist who works in, in anti-racist and animal liberation struggles. Francesco is working on a, a BA in philosophy from Brooklyn College where he is a, he is a Mellon Mays undergraduate fellow. CUNY Pipeline Fellow and Rosen Fellow. He is currently applying to a PhD programs and is interested in analyzing the encounters between critical animal studies, decolonial thought, and black studies, drawing on thinkers such as Sylvia, Sylvia Winter, Horton Spillers, and Walter Vignolo. Francesco hopes to develop more critical conceptualizations of the non-human and the animality as part of the larger project of Western modern modernity, anti-blackness, and colonialism. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. So before I start, I just want to preface with a few things. Uh, first, I just want to thank the Critical Animal Studies Conference Committee and all the organizers for creating the space for some really important dialogue. And I'm really appreciative of it because I feel like a lot of academics talk about making academia more social justice oriented, but very few people are putting the labor to do it. Um, the second thing is that uh, due to time constraints, I've cut out some sections. And this is very much a work in progress, so I really appreciate any feedback I can get. And the final thing is that I'm experiencing a little bit of altitude sickness because I'm from New York. Uh, so if it sounds like I'm gasping for air, I am. Please excuse me. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. So in 2007, the radical animal rights group, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, PETA, released a project titled We Are All Animals in the form of a traveling exhibit. Its imagery was unsettling. One panel showed a photo from the 1930s of a lynching in Indiana, and next to it, a cow hung by its limbs in the slaughterhouse. Another, their burned body of a black man from a 1919 race riot, next to a rooster being set on fire. But by far its most infamous, and what has heavily shaped popular images of the American animal liberation movement, being relegated and known as the dreaded comparison, was the juxtaposition of the black slave next to the exploited animal. Reactions from observers, civil rights leaders, and various media outlets were largely oppositional, dismissing the controversial project as antagonistic, racist, and outright absurd. One organizer from the SPLC condemned the exhibit, stating, black people in America have had quite enough of being compared to animals without PETA joining in. Perhaps the most pressing question, then, is what does this so-called dreaded comparison hope to achieve, and what about this imagery is so deeply unsettling? In short summary, the dreaded comparison is premised upon the following logic. The juxtaposition of subject A, the black slave, and B, the animal, is not, in theory, intended to denigrate and animalize the former, but rather invoke that very history of animalization as a means of initiating discussion of the latter. By juxtaposing two physically similar instances of violence, the black slave next to the animal slave, advocates hope to provoke the following three points. First, to invite inquiry into why case A, anti-black violence, is supposedly culturally condemned and recognized as unacceptable, while case B, animal violence, is naturalized and left unsettled. Second, to consider the similarities, considering the similarities between both cases, questioning whether the oppressive system which case A was subjected to has truly ended, or rather that the victims have just changed. And finally, to assert the case of animal liberation as similar to that of slavery abolition or other civil rights movements. However, these discourses have not been met without resistance, especially by those whose histories are being instrumentalized as the oppositional foil. And how have the proponents themselves responded to such critical advances? Activists who have embraced such comparisons have often responded to such accusations as further evidence of their point, questioning precisely why is it that we outright condemn histories of anti-blackness yet are so quick to trivialize and dismiss the inclusion of non-human animals within our moral compass. What makes speciesism and anti-blackness so incomparable? In other words, animal rights activists assert that those who oppose these comparisons from the thinking that animal suffering could not possibly be compared to human suffering are compelled to do so out of their speciesism, and it is this visceral compulsion to reject such comparisons which should become a site of intense interrogation. In other words, it is not the image which ought to be challenged, but the reaction which the image provokes within the observer. When asked about the common responses he's received towards his black slavery, animal slavery comparisons, one participant stated the following. The fact that people get so hysterical about his comparisons just show how profound they are. People go on about how you can't compare animals to our struggle. 
why not? People compare these things all the time. The only way people can rationalize this is if they already believe they are so above animals that to, compare, to, to be compared to them would be degrading. The fact that we are offended by being compared to animals just shows how degraded animals are. Comparing slavery to animals is only offensive if you're speciesist. When asked about the same topic, another participant expressed similar sentiments. I don't think it's wrong to compare them at all, he said. In fact, I think it's what's necessary. People are so violently speciesist that they probably won't care unless they're shown that they're engaging in the same behavior that they supposedly fight against. Here, we see that both activists rationalize the backlash of, against comparisons of anti-blackness and speciesism as the result of speciesism itself, rather than perhaps emanating from another source. And this reduction of black, uh, backlash as a result of speciesism are predominant in animal rights politics. Rather than viewing opposition to these comparisons through an essentialist speciesist lens, I propose to problematize this discourse in such a way which pays closer attention to the ways in which, as Claire Jean Kim puts it, race and species are connected in historically transgressive ways. Through this lens, the dreaded comparison becomes a site in which animality, blackness, nature, and the human are yoked together as some sort of post-humanist and pro-animal imperative, assuming the integration and occupation of all racialized subjects, in this case black life, within Western humanity is indeed what has occurred. And it is this human-animal binary which is now what is to be overcome. Furthermore, despite the usage of black suffering and slavery as a negative foil for animal liberation and against human exceptionalism, proponents have rarely taken these transgressive histories seriously, relegating critiques of anti-blackness as species impulse. Unpacking why, <coughs> sorry, unpacking why the dreaded comparison is indeed so dreaded allows us a deeper insight into the constitutive nature of animality, species, race, and taxonomies. To understand why this, rate, why this image is so dreaded, it is necessary to understand the ways in which blackness has been excluded from Western humanity, with animalization being one of many disciplinary and dehumanizing mechanisms. I will be exploring this history through two key texts, Sylvia Winter's 1492, A New World View, and Michael Lundblad's Birth of a Jungle. So in 1492, A New World View, scholar Sylvia Winter traces the discursive shifts between notions of human difference. In the 16th century, a shift occurs from the prior religious model and the homogenous notion of the human species it enabled towards a global remapping of humans on the basis of rationality, which came to be heavily shaped by Aristotelian notions of the natural slave. The significance of this move towards a global remapping of humans by degrees of rationality ought to be seen as implications of species difference, insofar as the utilization of Aristotelian notions of the natural slave initiated a move away from a homogenous notion of the human species towards a non-homogenous one. Thus, the natural slave, European humanism, and notions of irrationality increasingly displaced the previous religious model, providing the conceptual foundation of theorizing innate human difference, which comes to be the foundation of race. Furthermore, this idea of race was premised upon what Nelson Maldonado Torres argues is the central logic of European modernity, that is, permanent skepticism, in particular towards the humanity of the colonized. This humanistic skepticism <coughs> and the non-homogenizing of the human species via notions of rationality allowed Europeans to codify a notion of innate or natural human superiority premised upon phenotypic difference or biological structure or degrees of humanity which comes to be intelligible today as the category of racial difference. The colonization of the Americas and development of the transatlantic slave trade is constituted by a key shift, that is the African being racialized as the only innately enslavable group, with slavability being linked to heredity. Enslavement became not conditional as it was previously, but ontological, conceptualized as a new European notion of blackness. In other words, the ontological inscription of enslavability into the African body produced the conceptual foundation from which blackness could be made intelligible. If the colonized were all located within the space between the human, so-called secular European man, and the non-human, it was black life which inhabited a unique space as the only legitimately enslavable population on the basis of heredity. It was within this newly developing Western order of things in which secular European man overrepresented itself as exemplifying the human or all of humanity, with its others denigrated into the non-human categories of savage, animal, and slave. Race, therefore, represented exclusion from the locus of humanity, with its others such as the native and its pure negative ontological foil, the black slave. 
These conditions made possible what is now a racial borderlands of sorts between European man as the highest degree of human and the non-human or animal with non-white subjects located within the in-between, a space fraught with ambiguity and transgression. Here, the most base humans meet and overlap with the most human-like animals and beasts. Differing imaginings and invocations of these borderlands typically position the black subject as outside the margins of the human. However, despite its positionality along the margins of humanity, black life was constitutive and central to Western modernity. What is perhaps just as unsettling uh, about the dreaded comparison is its implicit assumptions of the black liberation struggle. Masquerading as an attempt to understand animality, race, and human exceptionalism by invoking its history, it simultaneously negates that history in its articulation. The image of the black slave next to the exploited animal articulates a moral story which is by nature extensionist. As society marches forward with inevitable progress, our circle of moral concern expands to, expands to gradually include those who occupy the margins, black people, women, and indigenous people, and now in our current moment, animals. Since the historical black slave functioned as a foil for the contemporary animal, anti-blackness is relegated to history, assumed as a lesson already learned. With black life liberated from the assemblages of Western man, and thus assimilated within the human, it is now our imperative to move on to the next one, so to speak. The issue here, then, is twofold. First, the image's unawareness and lack of engagement to the synergistic histories of animality and blackness. And second, it assumes the black subject is already included within the expanding moral circle, with the final frontier being non-human animals. Yet two instances come to mind which push back against this narrative. First, the mobilizing outrage and sympathy of white America towards the killing of Cecil the Lion and Harambe the Silverback Gorilla in comparison to a dead silence and hostility towards Black Lives Matter. Second, the perceived disparate treatment between black residents and pets in storm-devastated New Orleans. Considering the following, first, media pitches like the lion which has captured hearts around the globe and silence toward the murder of Sandra Bland which happened within the same time frame. Second, the image of pets in New Orleans being brought to safety with black residents being largely neglected. And third, a 2013 article titled, If Zimmerman walks and Dick didn't, does that mean a dog's life is worth more than a black man? suggests that in many instances, black life was located below non-human animals within the white imaginary. These historical moments provided an unsettling look into the US racial order which should give us pause. In particular, they offer a telling story of white people's concern for non-human animals within an anti-black climate, which should be seen as the result of changing meanings of animality within 20th century America. Darwin's The Descent of Man and Freud's Totem and Taboo, along with other uh, selections, of evolutionary scientific literature were instrumental to the paradigm shift from the Christian narratives of man's origin to the evolutionary narratives which informs our current species politics. Darwin and Freud's evolutionary narrative both were a product of the political moment in which they were producing knowledge. The transition from knowledge is shaped and premised upon divinity towards the supposed scientific and objective. The evolutionary narrative connected three prime figures, man, which was synonymous with the white race, the savage, which was synonymous with the black and indigenous races, and the animal, in such a way which transgressed previous understandings of species difference that purported an absolute separatism between the three. Producing a scientific lineage which tied all three to a common lowly origin was itself destabilizing to the Western order, but the move of asserting man, or the white race, as descended from the savage, as opposed to animals, was especially disturbing and provocative for white anxieties. In other words, while blurring while the blurring of human-animal separatism and the blow to human exceptionalism it produced was problematic, the connection between the white race and the black and indigenous races was especially transgressive. Um, <clears throat> the destabilization of the Western racial and species order required, required whites to redefine the human, scrutinizing and making intelligible new gaps which separated man, the savage, and the animal. <clears throat> and while the project involved all three figures, it was the re-exclusion of blackness from Western humanity, which was the primary goal. The civilized and thus the human was now answerable by the capacity for humane culture. In other words, the capacity to treat both humans and especially animals by a certain standard of humaneness. <clears throat> the narrative to account for these new emerging ideologies, such as humane culture, revolved primarily around questions of instinct and delight in torture. As Michael Lundblad in Birth of a Jungle notes, 
Once evolutionary thinking challenges the boundaries between the human and the animal, humane behavior apparently becomes a new way to define what it means to be human, to restrain one's animal instincts. The sign of civilization became, became one's capacity to repress one's animal instincts and practice humane behavior, while savagery, which was defined in opposition, was the delight in torture and inflicting pain. However, as Lundblad argues, whites began to associate themselves more and became increasingly interested with the figure of the animal and their inner animal instincts. <clears throat> Not only did whites more comfortably trace their biological likeness more closely to animals than the racialized savage, but the turn of the century saw an increasing interest with one's inner animal and what political implications this had for punishment. Humane culture raised critical question over man's inner animality, which was eventually reflected within the juridical discourse which juridical discourse, which purported that violence stemming from animal instincts or impassioned impulses were excusable, while such behavior anim animated by ill intent or savage desires received harsher punishment. This development was central, not coincidental, to the construction of the black male rapist myth prominent within the same climate. While the racial narrative of the rape of white women by black men has typically been thought to have been rationalized as due to blacks, black men's supposed inner animality, Lundblad demonstrates that it was black men's supposed savagery, not their animality, which was designated as the animating force. The rape of white women was framed as motivated by a savage pleasure in torture or inflicting pain, rather than acting on animal instincts. This strategic move allowed both a flexible and strategic discursive mechanism for anti-blackness, while also excusing the actions of white lynch mobs as due to <coughs> animal instincts, or impassioned heat of the moment <coughs> mobilizations of justice. How much time do I have left? Um, yeah, like about a minute. Okay. So I'm going to... Uh, okay. Uh, so I'm going to skip to the last paragraph, <laughs> so I don't have time. Uh, the imperative, then, is to take these histories seriously and meaningfully interrogate race, animality, the human, and species. Ironically, animal rights discourse actually intentionally hits upon something deeply profound and all-encompassing. That is, its conceptualization of speciesism. The current discourse presumes that all humans are indeed considered fully human, and utilize species difference as a tool of domination. However, considering the aforementioned, we can push back against this wisdom while retaining no the notion of species as a disciplinary mechanism. Conventional wisdom posits that some humans have been relegated from the category of human to the category of non-human, being stripped of their humanity through dehumanization. However, such a category presupposes that racialized subjects were previously included within the human and had a humanity within the dominant system to be stripped of. I suggest that speciesism may be a useful intellectual tool insofar as it redefined as a method of dominant humans disciplining subordinate humans and animals into varying genres of non-human. Thus, if any insight or imperative is to be gleaned from the so-called dreaded comparison, it ought to be the ways in which race has been inextricably linked to species difference and understanding exactly what animality as a disciplinary mechanism entails beyond, such a, beyond a literal, literal uh, similarity of non-human animals. Thank you. Uh, if anyone wants to push me more on some of my arguments, I cut out like three pages. So if it seems a bit scattered, feel free to push me during the Q&A. Thanks. Thanks so much. All right. Next up, we have Robert Cease, who um, is a professor here at Fort Lewis College. And he was discussing nihilism and the desperation in place-based resistance. Um, then Dr. Luther. Right. Mark Cease is an associate professor of sociology at Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado. He has published on a variety of topics ranging from juvenile death penalty to environmental topics including the Clean Air Act, global warming, ozone depletion, and acid rain, to various types of environmental crime, to globalization and the environment, to issues Concerning radical environmentalism, his primary research interests include sustainable communities, all things environment, anarchist studies, and radical pedagogy. Very good. Thanks. Okay, um, I'm going to, because I have a tendency to ramble, so I'm going to read so I can get within the 20 minutes time, but I'm going to try to make sure that I read it slowly so you can understand. So um, the other, the, so just to give you a quick preface of what I'm doing is uh, 
This was a, a paper I published a couple of years ago, actually, and um, I never really presented it, so this is the first time I actually do that. So, um, but uh, what I'm focusing on in here is the, the concept of cultural nihilism and the creation of nihilism in our culture and its inability to prevent us to act freely. And I'm using uh, as sort of case studies communiques that are from ELF, okay, from the Earth Liberation Front, okay? And so you'll see kind of how I put this together. All right. So the title of my paper was Nihilism and Desperation in Place-Based Resistance. Okay? And one of the most daunting challenges of our time is to construct a collective vision for how humans should live in nature. The dominant culture continues to persist in the destruction of our planet. Notwithstanding the ecological decline in just about every living system on the planet, there remains cultural resistance to establishing a sustainable collective vision for how humans should live in nature. Witness the lack of discussion uh, that, uh, of such topics in the U.S. presidential debate. Uh, despite a growing number of voices to the contrary, the dominant culture is still guided by a belief that nature is, above all, a resource for human exploitation. The struggles of activists to preserve the integrity of place against the dominant ideology of nature as resource can be interpreted as an attempt to generate and affirm human meaning in connection with non-human nature. Another way of interpreting activist efforts to resist the destruction of place is a struggle against nihilism, against the obliteration of the individual's ability to experience meaning and to engage physically, emotionally, and cognitively with the natural world. In this paper, I sketch out a conception of cultural nihilism and, nihil and the nihilist bind as it pertains to my analysis of cultural nihilism and individual place-based resistance through an examination of communiques from the Elf Liberation Front. These were extracted from Jay Hasbrook's dissertation titled Primitive Dissidents, Earth Liberation Front, and the Making of a Radical Anthropology. The term nihilism first appeared in 1787 and then again in 1796 and 1797 and became widely used in the 19th century. In the first half of the century, nihilism was linked to the intellectual study of idealism. And in the later half of the 19th century, Nihilism began to be associated with the nothingness that was created in God's death, as Nietzsche eloquently illustrated in his essay, The Madman. Nihilism has been expressed in many ways. It's been described as a historical process, a psychological state, a philosophical position, a cultural condition, a sign of weakness, a sign of strength, as, dangers of, uh, as the danger of dangers, and as a divine way of thinking. Other philosophical uh, categories of nihilism include lethiological nihilism, which is the denial of the reality of truth, ontological or metaphysical nihilism, which is the denial of independently existing world, expressed in the claim nothing is real. Another philosophical category is ethical or moral nihilism. An ethical or moral nihilist does not deny that people use moral ethical terms. The claim is rather that these terms refer to nothing more than the basis, or excuse me, than the bias or taste of the assertive. Existential nihilism denotes a belief that life has no intrinsic meaning and therefore is pointless and absurd. Political nihilism holds that the political, economic, and social institutions of society are so corrupt that they need to be destroyed, a type of nihilism expressed by Derek Jensen in his book Endgame. Anybody familiar with that? Okay. Innuendos of nihilism as a problem confronting the truth of subjective experience have been around since the Greeks. Every thinking human being has probably experienced some skepticism about truth claims. A healthy individual skepticism is without doubt a good thing. But when does nihilism become debilitating and destructive to human dignity? Friedrich Nietzsche warned that the threat of nihilism, quote, uncanniest of all guests, end quote, represented in the death of truth, would create a crisis in which everything lacks meaning and hence, quote, awakens the suspicion that all interpretations of the world are false. Nietzsche foreshadowed what has become the greatest challenge of postmodernity, creating meaning in the absence of meaning, but not in the absence of power. Power is central to the study of culturally generated nihilism. Capitalist cultures represent a normalized set of objectives and behaviors which are solidified in state-sanctioned legal codes and normalized in institutional behaviors. When power manifested through economic, political, and social institutions negates individual moral and ethical action, then individual nihilism becomes a cultural condition, a permanent cultural condition. Most cult, uh, postmodern culture places the individual into a precarious moral existence where every individual is allowed to believe what they want to, 
been forced to live the way power dictates. Capitalist cultural imperatives render individual moral agency impotent, reducing ethical behavior to a series of personal decisions about consumption. Cultural power is manifested in the unquestioned acceptance of corporate and government exploitation of people and nature in the pursuit of profit. Individual nihilism exists when individual moral and ethical agency are relegated to the realm of, indivi of individual consumer preferences. Karen Carr suggests that the cheerful acquiescence of nihilism leads to the perpetuation of the status quo, a condition in which power alone determines what is ethical, moral, and intellectually worthy of pursuing. The psychological cost of this moral precariousness is what I refer to as the nihilist bind. The nihilist bind occurs when existing social forces deny us human agency. The ability to act on values and interpret our own subjective experiences with others in an attempt to frame an alternative collective vision. What postmodern civilization is placing beyond our reach is agency. The ability to actualize our subjective values in discourse with others in creating authentic modes of existence. I can no more live in a world where the air I breathe is healthy and the water I drink free of carcinogens carcinogens, then I can live in a culturally conscious world that works towards that end. In fact, working for such a world places me at odds with the political, economic, and social systems and institutions that prioritize commerce over people and nature. In a world where all truth claims may be, like it or not, construed on equal footing with all other truth claims, only a few holding the reins of economic and political power decide how we live. As atomized individuals, we remain powerless unable to act as moral agents with other moral agents in the production of our lives. Corporate capitalism and, hegemonic uh, and the hegemonic nature of nationalism have successfully robbed individuals of their moral and ethical agency, reducing individuals to masses, generating the types of adaptations discussed by scholars like Eric Fromm, uh, who referred to that as the automaton, C. Wright Mills as the cheerful robots, and Herbert Marcuse's uh, one-dimensional men. Attempts by individuals to formulate alternative discourses in our postmodern world are immediately marginalized as special interest politics confined to lobbying, voting, commentary, and state-approved protest. Hold your sign in the appropriate cage or offer your one-minute timed comment expressing your utter disgust with the Forest Service's endorsement to open another roadless area to oil and gas exploitation, mining, or logging. These prescribed modes of dissent are exercises in futility at best, humiliating and infuriating at worst. We now turn to those who find such prescriptions for ending environmental destruction as unacceptable, and hence a source of desperation and individual nihilism. We will now turn to the text of ELF, taken from J. Hesburgh's dissertation. Keep in mind, ELF are classified as an eco-terrorist organization by the U.S. Congress. Okay. Quoting ELF, Time is running out. Change must come, or eventually all will be lost. A belief in state-sanctioned legal means of social change is a sign of faith in the legal system of that same state. We have absolutely no faith in the legal system of the state when it comes to protecting life, as it has repeatedly shown itself to care far more for the protection of commerce and profits than for its people and the natural environment. <coughs> and quote. As the quote indicates, Desperation clearly underlies Elf's motives for damaging SUVs. That's what this particular action was about. The words, time is running out, change must come, or eventually all will be lost, expresses an end of the world crisis. The no faith in the legal system denotes the disingenuous nature of legal recourse as a means to halting further destruction to people and the environment. In this case, SUVs are targeted because they represent the culture of overconsumption. The number one target radical environmentalist actions are development and sprawl, followed by facilities conducting genetic engineering, followed by logging operations, and then support utility vehicles. Else targets are specific, and they are directed at the ideological heart of corporate capitalism. Take the following anonymous ELF communique, for example, quote, it is the same structure, big business and consumer society, that is directly responsible for the destruction of the planet for the sake of profit. When these entities have repeatedly demonstrated their prioritizing of monetary gain ahead of life, it is absolute foolishness to continue to ask them nicely for reform or revolution. Matters must be taken into the hands of the people who need to more and more step outside of this societal law to enforce natural law." End quote. The appeal to natural law suggests that ELF believes in higher law, 
In this case, probably the laws of nature and the universe. Elf members are obviously not nihilist in their beliefs. They believe in natural law in the universe, which requires that humans live differently than we do now. But elf beliefs are not shared by the status quo, and in fact are antithetical to the status quo. Take this elf communique, for instance. Quote, Western civilization with its throwaway conveniences, its status symbols, and its unfathomable hordes of financial wealth is unsustainable and comes at a price. It is pathological decadence, fueled by brutality and oceans of bloodshed, is quickly devouring all life and undermining the very life support system we need to survive. The quality of our air, water, and soil continues to decrease as more and more life forms on the planet suffer and die as a result. We are in the midst of a global environmental crisis that adversely affects and directly threatens every human, every animal, every plant, and every other life form on the face of the earth. Elf rejects the disconnection capitalism has from the natural world, as capitalism shows absolute preference for capital and profit with no regard for the consequences that extracting such a profit costs. Here is Elf, Elf's communique response to the mainstream environmentalist criticism of their use of property destruction. Quote, grassroots and mainstream organizations who have come out publicly against the actions of Elf do so either due to economic reasons, they rely on donations from the public, members, or grants from charities or governments or non-governmental organizations, and or they have a firm belief in an exceptional amount of faith in the system of government and operations in their particular area. Either way, this elk, uh, attitude demonstrates a clear misunderstanding and or a great reluctance to accept the seriousness of the threats, of, uh, threats to life on this planet and to make a firm commitment to work to actually stop the destruction of life. All of us must remember that the movement to protect all life must not be a means of monetary gain for individuals and organizations, but rather one that produces concrete results. The ELF, along with many supporters, believe that many mainstream environmentalists are careerists and do not seek the abolition of industrial civilization, but rather its regulation through technical solutions. In fact, leading environmentalist thinkers Michael Schoenberg and Ted Norris in their article, quote, The Death of uh, Environmentalism, Global Warming Politics in Post-Environmental World, quote, have noted that every environmental leader they interviewed understood the immense urgency of global warming, but not one had a clear, articulate vision of how to confront the problem. They contend that green groups are defining the problem so narrowly, so unecologically, un that they have alienated potential allies and become just another special interest." End quote. Elf criticisms of the mainstream environmental movement is shared by many mainstream environmentalists, experiencing the nihilist bind from behind the walls of their nonprofit 501Cs. Does the full-scale conscious awareness of the scope of our environmental problems produce a state of individual nihilism? For ELF, the answer appears to be yes. The following communique followed an ELF action vandalizing construction equipment and an attempted arson of four houses under construction in Placer County, Pennsylvania. Quote, psychologically speaking, we are all on the verge of death with no way out in sight. Suicide, alcoholism, and drug addiction are epidemic. Nearly everyone is on drugs, be it Prozac, lithium, lattes, mochas, cigarettes, beer, pot, cocaine, or chocolate. The world we have is empty and boring us to death. We are forced to sell our souls 8, 10, 12, 14 plus hours a day, 5, 6, even 7 days a week, for more than half our lives, not to mention school before that. They have us work jobs we hate so we can buy shit we don't need. We are through with the laws." End quote. It is also clear from this communique that many engaging in elf activities do so out of a sense of reconciling the impotence created by the nihilist bind. As one anonymous elf writes, quote, you can, you can decide to be apathetic and complacent and hope for it all to collapse, or you can decide to take responsibility and fight to destroy this death machine. Either way, you will have blood on your hands. It's just a matter of whose, end quote. Taking responsibility for what is happening is the elf mantra. Take, for example, the communique, quote, there is absolutely no excuse for any one of us out of greed to knowingly allow this to continue. <coughs> There is a direct relationship between our irresponsible overconsumption and the lust for luxury products and the poverty and destruction of other people in the natural world. By refusing to acknowledge this simple fact, supporting this paradigm with our excessive lifestyle and failing to offer direct resistance, 
we make ourselves accomplices in the greatest crime ever committed." End quote. The resolution of the nihilist fine for the ELF participants is to engage in illegal property <coughs> destruction, risking being classified as a domestic terrorist and subjected to lengthy prison sentences. Their risks are rationalized by the alternative, which is being complicit in the destruction of the planet, a relegation of their agency they refuse to accept. Do ELF members really think they are going to bring down state-organized corporate consumer capitalism with random acts of property destruction? The ELF communique offers some insights. Quote, we are not so naive as to believe that we would have stopped development in 12 bridges, though we could have caused over 2 million in damages. It was still a fair symbolic protest, and the messages should have all registered that we are exceptionally serious, the necessity of new discussions, and that all of the true eco-terrorists, such as JTS, which I believe was the firm that was uh, building 12 bridges, should consider themselves forewarned, end quote. There is little doubt ELF wants to encourage other like-minded individuals to engage in eco-sabotage, but they do not appear naive about the overall impact of their work on the culture they wish to destroy. ELF creates, if nothing else, a discourse about the state of our environment. Legislature are more apt to not see mainstream environmentalists as radical, making environmental groups' demands more palatable. Unfortunately, the deeper message that ELF seeks to convey, which is that life is sacred and not negotiable, will fall on deaf ears in back rooms where the natural environment is bartered as a commodity for consumption. One can speculate that ELF actions create a sense of power in what is otherwise, for most eco-conscious ELFs, a hopeless and powerless situation. There probably is a spark of excitement and empowerment in acting in defiance of the totalitarian culture that seeks to make us blind and dumb nihilists, dumb enough to watch our future dissolve in front of our eyes. As the younger generations came of age, realizing they have little in the way of any future, it is doubtful they will be contented with false promises and choices. Humans can understand emptiness, but in almost all circumstances they reject it in favor of a meaningful existence. And when the culture cannot provide meaning, they will create it. Nihilism is an unbearable condition and extremely dangerous when fueled by desperation. And that's all I have. Structural Oppression. Sean Parson is an assistant professor in the Department of Politics and International Affairs and the MA in Sustainable Communities at Northern Arizona University. His work, his work covers a, a wide range of topics from radical political theory and social movements and scholarship, movement scholarship to cultural studies. He has a forthcoming book titled Cooking Up Revolution, Food Not Bombs, Gentrification and the Politics of Space and is also working on an edited book titled Heroes Beyond the Human, Superheroes, and Critical Animal Studies. Thank you very much, and thank you for the first two papers. These were phenomenal, and I think we're going to have quite a lot to talk about after um, I finish. Um, and hopefully my paper will be able to add, quite, uh, add some, too, to the discussion of race and animal liberation. So this paper idea that I'm working on, this kind of project I'm th trying to work through intellectually, um, is coming out of an article I wrote for Counterpunch about a year ago after the death of Cecil the Lion, um, where I was noticing people like Roxane Gay, who I love, and others kind of having this narrative that white people obviously much care much more about animals than they do black lives. And for people who are involved in animal liberation movements, that's obviously not necessarily universally true, right? There's how many animals have absolutely no matter or no value or worth at all in, the, in our society. And then I was seeing animal um, rights activists using the phrase all lives matter, which is equally as troubling and problematic. Um, and so I want to kind of keep working on this idea and try to think through the way that race and species work together. Um, that's kind of the point of this project. Um, and with that, I want to engage with some of the work in total liberation. Um, I feel like when it first developed this concept of total liberation, this idea of 
different forms of oppression all being linked served a really important purpose of making connections to things that people had not yet made connections to. Uh, but I think today there is a simplicity to a lot of the analysis that actually makes it harder for activists to really think about how ways things interact. Um, I always like to think of a metaphor of, of oppression is, is more like a ball of yarn that's been kind of tied up together. You pull some strands and it chokes others. It's not necessarily each strand is connected. And you have to actually think through the ways in which they're tied together to actually get a sense of how to untangle the knot of oppression. Um, and so what I want to do here is I want to focus on a discussion of race, a quick one on animality, and I want to bring in, in both cases, political theory. I have a background, I'm a political theorist, and so it's going to be more theoretical than it will be empirical. Um, so I want to start with the discussion of race in the United States. Um, race, I would argue, and not controversially, is if not the most important, at least one of the most important um, dividing lines within contemporary and historical US politics. Um, and if you look back at the history and the development of the racial order in the US, you notice a very interesting um, Marxian analysis that can develop. And I'm taking this, um, this analysis from W.E.B. Du Bois' phenomenal work, Black Reconstruction, but also my friend Joel Olson's phenomenal book, The Abolition of White Democracy. So, Prior to about the 1620s, um, race in the US was not yet codified or solidified. You had a system in which white and black were both, um, both enslaved in some sense and also brought in as free labor. And you had a system in which there was not this strong uh, racial order. And what was developing was cross, um, cross marriages, people living together, and alliances of working class folks white and black in opposition to the colonial leaders oppressing and exploiting labor of these people. And so the owners of capital in this period decided to pass laws around race that constructed blackness and tying it to slavery. And this, what this effectively does is if you have a bourgeoisie and a proletariat, what it does is it forces a race line through the proletariat line and creates a white proletariat and a black proletariat. And this racial line becomes the racial order that separates the lines. And that becomes a foundation of white supremacist order in the United States. It's this race line that develops in around the 1620s in Virginia, continues on all the way through to today. Um, when you think of this racial order, it has a handful of huge both economic and political aspects. Economically, the race line creates what Michael Rodiger um, calls the wages of white. And so being on the right side of the racial line confers economic and social material benefits. Um, and, that, and I would argue that you could see a weakening of that wage of whiteness to some degree in the, in the reaction from the, the white nationalists and white working class people, the support of Trump, and the kind of move towards a lot of these issues has to deal with reforming and reinforcing that wage of whiteness that is probably weakened over the last couple centuries. Um, this wage of whiteness primarily divides the working class. It allows for a massive exploitation of people across the board, and it allows it to happen because people who are um, called white are given a benefit that, that roughly breaks down a system of solidarity. In addition, the race line provides its own economy of policing it. It creates the, patern uh, the police system, the current criminalization system, it creates a system currently around uh, payday loans, around a bunch of different aspects of our contemporary political economy is tied to an economy of this race line. And so this race line becomes still really important for the maintenance of contemporary capitalism. All right. Um, when it comes to actual politics itself, though, and this is coming from my friend Joel Olson, the race line also defined American citizenship tied to race. So what it meant to be free in the US is white. What it meant to not be a citizen is black. And this creation of the black, what he calls anti-citizen, was the foundation of, what, of the Herr Volk Republic, which is the idea of there's a republic, there's a democracy for some, and a, and a system of pure oppression for the others. And this Herr and Volk Republic, and this idea of that black anti-citizen continues on again today. Um, if you remember the discussions when Obama was running for office, there was questions about um, him being a more acceptable white black man. He 
was not seen as embracing the quote unquote black politics of kind of the previous era, but a, a almost post racial blackness. And so he had to almost define himself in a way as being mostly or partially white in order to be accepted to be a political citizen that does a, has an ability to lead. Um, that's an example of how this race line works politically. So expanding on this, um, and this will, I think, be a link that will tie to, to the discussion of animals. Um, the current work in the field of Afro-pessimism, I'm thinking here of mostly Wilderson, whose work I really like, um, makes the argument that at its core, what we call humanity is contrasted with the concept of blackness. And this is a foundational ontological claim that goes back not just to the US, but through the Western world. So what it means to be human was to be white. What it means to not be human meant you were black. And his argument ends up being then that any anti-white politics or any pro-black politics has to, by definition, be anti-human. Anti uh, it needs to resist the categorization of what it means to be human, because otherwise, the only way to make black men, especially in his work, seem as acceptable to audiences is to make them white increasingly. The closer they get to what we define as white, the more they can be, um, we can have sympathy with them. And so his goal is to create a, an understanding of the politics that doesn't want to make the black white, but to smash the binary of black and white. What he doesn't do, and I think what really would help, is he doesn't theorize the way that animality fits into the system of, of, black, of, anti, of anti blackness itself. So I wanted to move quickly, and since it's an animal studies conference, I won't spend as much time on it, and discuss a little bit of the way that animal oppression works. So we have a discussion of how race worked a little bit around political economy and things like that. Anim this animal difference is a deeper divide. Um, if the concept of race really developed in the world around the colonial period in the US, the separation between humans and animals goes back thousands of years, and it's really probably impossible to get a sense of when it fully, or when it originally started. Was it the Greeks? Was it the Jewish um, monotheistic text? Was it before that? Um, but in any case, what we've seen develop across the board is a structured system of hierarchy. Um, the most clear is that kind of medieval uh, chain of being, in which we have this hierarchy of chains of being. Um, and I feel like that concept of animality is still there. So you have a separation where the human is defined in contrast to the animal, but then there's a hierarchy of animals, right? Not all animals are treated equally. Um, and so, for instance, you have the Greeks, you have Aristotle developing a strong conception of species, but also a conception of species that differentiates, right? So that which eats the other animal is higher in its order. So he defines um, higherness of animals by what eats what. Um, and so if you can eat something, then you're better than it. Roughly, it's how he thought of it. So he creates his own hierarchy there. Um, and when you think of this hierarchy and the separation between human and animal, it does similarly an economic and a political thing. Economically, uh, for as long as humans have had civilization, the foundation of economic wealth has been predicated on the exploitation of non human animals. Um, they have provided free labor, free resources. If you read even classical economic texts, they're defined as in much the same way that they define the earth. They're just free resources for us to exploit and use. And that concept is not new to modern age. That goes back thousands of years. And politically, what the separation between human and animals does is it really defines what it means to be a human. And so the human, just like blackness defines the citizen, the animal defines the human. And so when you then go back to that Afro-pessimism that I'm talking about before, that Wilkerson had, where it's humanity is a white concept and it's contrasted with blackness. I think you could expand that to being, there is a concept of humanity that is linked with whiteness, and at its other extreme is not blackness, but animality. And blackness is a figure that sits in the middle that is curt, that gets pushed back and forth between animality and whiteness. And so it's, it's a category that is in that, that, in that kind of spectrum. And so the contrast in Afro-pessimism since then is to understand, it doesn't change anything, right? The, still the goal, the goal of the politics will be a politics that abolishes the concept of the human. Um, it just kind of adds this animal dimension to kind of add a, a context that I think would help bring in 
a system of oppression that they don't get to. Um, all right, so what does this look like? How much do I have? Cool, awesome. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what thinking this way might do to change how we think about animal liberation activism. Okay, so the first one it does is it complicates our understanding of species and race. So when Cecil the Lion, for instance, um, gained public attention, what he effectively did, I would argue, is by giving him a name, by creating the symbolic meaning, he broke through this, the human species barrier. Right? So he became associated and sympathized and empathized in a way in which we generally do with, with a lot of humans. People mourn him in the same way, they have these emotional connections. And I think this happens really commonly for pet animals. I think anyone here who shares a house or a life with a dog has had this experience as well. Right? They become part of the family. Right? They become not just an animal, but they become a part of your life in a very deep, emotionally meaningful way. The thing is, in the US system, when something is brought into the category of human, like so they get brought into this filter of race. So for instance, when different immigrant groups have moved to the United States, they've confronted the system of white, black, binary race, and they've been filtered into a racialized order. Right? So most people originally when they get brought over here are filtered as being closer to black, and then you have a system in which whiteness regularly opens up and allows the inclusion of formerly non-white people to join the privileges of white, of white supremacy. You have that with the Irish. You know, there's a piece over there on uh, anti-white, uh, over there on anti-whiteness by Noel Nativ. He has a phenomenal book on how the Irish became white. Um, you have it with the Italians, with the Greeks, and the most recent category, the Jews. Um, and you can see, and people have made arguments if you are seeing something similar or some attempts to also include Latinos and Latinos within the category of whiteness. Um, that's stopped with Trump, but there was an attempt by Republicans to it seemed for a while to maybe try to do that. The same thing I argue happens when you bring animals and into the category of gaining human characteristics. So what that happens is, let's say you have a the best example of this I would think of is we separate human or farmed animals and like companion animals. Companion animals get brought in, and for instance, dogs get filtered in, and for the most part, breeds become racialized. Um, the pit bull bans, the pushes for that, are not are tied largely to the racialization of this this new species that's been brought into the category of race. The opposition to it is tied to white supremacy. It's not tied to anything else. Likewise. I would generally assume most people would associate golden retrievers with whiteness. Like, almost to like a, a sense where everyone's kind of like, yeah, that makes sense, right? So these breeds actually get brought into a racial order and then, then categorized and filtered within this racial system. So we as activists need to pay attention. When we're doing this, are we then bringing in a species, and then how is it being racialized? And are we confronting the way in which species are being racialized in the same way that we're confronting a racial order more time? Another way that this process works, um, and this is from it coming from Claire Kim's new book that if people have not read is totally phenomenal, called Dangerous Crossings. It's on the intersection of race and animal rights. It's phenomenal. Um, but a lot of the times, as animal rights activists and animal liberationists, we tend to want to fight the battles we can win as best as we can. And the way that the racial order works is it means certain groups have more or less power than others. Which means that practices that involve animals that are tied to people of color are going to be tactically easier for us to defeat. This is really problematic too, right? Because it means that there will be a tension between communities of color and animal rights activists over this question. So, thank you. So for instance, you could think of, and she looks at two examples of this. One was, the resistance to dog fighting in the South and its connections to blackness, which led to a massive outcry publicly that went beyond the animal rights community. And she said that tied in largely into the way that animal rights activists mobilized race as a way to defend the animals. So in that regard, the fight, the end, a good and valuable work to end dog fighting actually reinforced white supremacy in her analysis. And you can make the same argument she, she gives towards the live animal markets in Chinatown and San Francisco. 
they relied on and used and mobilized anti-Chinese racial stereotypes as a way of mobilizing mostly white um, activists against these markets. Again, not saying, I'm, not, I'm personally not saying that these are right or wrong, just I think if you start thinking about how race and species work, it complicates stuff in a really difficult way. Um, another way it complicates things is the fight for um, Black Lives Matter or for any kind of racial support is generally, t generally tied to this concept of, of defending their humanness from their animality. So if you ever read Franz Fanon, he you know, famously kind of declared that he is human. And he really has a lot of species as language, and people have been critical of Fanon and a lot of decolonial figures for doing that. Um, and I think that this, is, this too is tied to the system of white supremacy. It's a response to it. The system of white supremacy has created a filtering system that forces people of color to be structured between whiteness and animality. And these have very serious material benefits. Um, and so the push to do that, I think, is both understandable and tied within this larger system. So we need to kind of understand that context when we're providing critiques of other movements as well. Um, and lastly, because I think I only have about a minute or two. Oh, cool. Um, lastly, what does this mean moving forward? And I'm not sure. Maybe one of the things I might ask if you want to have a conversation about it or a question is going back to the concept of Afro-pessimism and bringing it into almost like an animal rights pessimism or an animal liberation pessimism in that kind of concept. If um, any pro-black or pro-animal politics um, is going to exist, it needs to be anti-humanity. It needs to contrast itself and resist the desire to make itself white. And I want to ask people, what does that look like? What does it mean to think of animal liberation as a movement that is at its core oppositional and wanting to dismantle and destroy the concept of whiteness? What does it mean to engage in, a, in an animal rights politics that does everything it can to undermine white supremacy, white privilege, and engages in what Noel Adantif refers to as a, a race traitor politics. And so I kind of maybe want to end there. What would this look like, and how would this change the way we actually engage in politics if we take that as our primary mission as animal rights activists, is not just to protect animals, but to destroy and dismantle whiteness. So I'll kind of end there. Yeah. I just have a comment. I want to um, just applaud the, you know, um, bringing in Afro-pessimism into, into the conversation. I think it's super important. I think we have a lot to learn from radical black studies and um, critical animal yes. studies. And I love uh, Claire Kim's book a lot. Also, I had the pleasure of seeing her present recently. And it was interesting because she was mentioning how, you know, she's been struggling a lot with trying, you know, trying to talk about species with, you know, the, um, you know, the ethnic studies folks, and then mm -hmm. trying to talk about race with the animal studies uh -huh. people. And she's and what, uh, she made an observation which I thought was interesting. She said that she found that, you know, people in radical black studies have been because of because of the critique of humanism have been a lot more open to thinking about species than you know than the animal rights people have been open to thinking critically about race. So I'm just corroborating and applauding you. Thank you so yeah, much. I agree with that. <laughs> um, question is for Sean. Yeah. So when you, and I'm kind of new to this, so yeah. forgive me. Um, the, um, you brought out that the racial um, division was through the 1600s during colonialization. Yeah. And I'm curious why you start the conversation at that um, because if you go back in history, um, both religious and socioeconomic oppression was back for millennium, and I, oh. and I just wonder why the conversation is limited in this way. So I do that for two reasons. One, um, the radical black tradition tends to focus at that moment, and I was really taking an influence from that. Um, and that was gener is generally considered the moment in which racism developed. So prior to the development of a racial order in the US, race operated differently throughout the world. There was obviously categorizations of like Greek and non-Greek or this or that, but it was not racialized in quite the same way, um, at least according to like radical black thinkers. So I started there 
largely because I wanted to talk about the American context um, and, American, and really focus on, on the American context around race. But I think you know, the history of oppression goes back to the creation of civilization, right? Um, in some way, in some form. I mean, I guess just speaking as a Jewish yep. person and knowing about pogroms and knowing yes. about, you know, all the, the yes. Crusades and you could go back and back and back and then you can go back to the Romans and yes. how, you know, <coughs> so it just, it just seems a little bit arbitrary. And when I've written... It, it, oh, okay. yeah. I'm sorry, I know no, no, this no. was... Your, but in 1637, I believe, was the case and it was the yeah, John yeah. Punch, is what yes. you're referring to, right? Yeah. Which was a legal case that decided and sort of identified, so it's often a marker, so if you start yeah, yeah. there, like when you're talking about when racism was sort of born between white and black in the U.S., that was actually a, the legal precedent was set. And I think if we were focusing right now and looking at more of a European context, like I was really trying to be very U.S. specific, um, Jewishness was actually the primary category defining humanity racially. Um, and, and I think that would be yeah. seriously true. In the U.S., um, that concept of Jewishness was not nearly as strong as blackness. Um, so that's really the reason. But yeah, I think if you were looking at Europe, Jewishness would be, would roughly serve that same function as blackness in the U.S., at least historically. Could I jump off that as well? Yeah. Uh, something else to add to that is that, like you pointed out, this is actually a really profound and critical discussion about when race actually comes to fruition. Yeah. And there, there's definitely, um, notions of difference uh, in the early modern period and before that, especially along lines of gender and disability, as well as like ethnic differences. <coughs> but the key shift and why a lot of decolonial and radical black thinkers uh, pinpoint the creation of race in the 16th century is because um, prior to that time, even though difference was intelligible, the dominant European model of understanding human difference was largely homogenous, so, so that yeah, there are different types of humans along gender and disability, but in the eyes of God, we are, we are all equal in the sense, even if they weren't treated equal, of course. And what happens with the development of the transatlantic slave trade and the, and the colonization of the Americas is that this idea begins to emerge that there are certain humans who are innately, like based on their body, irrational and savage. And that is kind of the first time that that really develops. And so that, that's kind of why a lot of people pinpoint the 16th century, because that's when a biological notion of race begins to truly develop. But again, like this discussion is really like ongoing because some people point toward towards the development of anti-blackness, towards the is like the uh, slave trade of Islam, you know. And you can keep going further and further. But in the 16th century is definitely a, a key point. I, would I think say. just add one more quick point. Um, if you look back at the time when it was kind of defined by difference, and we were all humans under the eyes of God. It was also often religiousized. That's also where the Jewishness becomes anti, tied to the opposition. Jews were not necessarily put in that same category, though they were given the opportunity by force to convert, right? And then they could become fully human. But yeah, it was still. Kind <laughs> Yeah. We still stay yeah. Hey, hey, Ian, um, I'm a little confused. So you, you tied the Earth Liberation Front to nihilism, but, but my, my thought is that nihilism, nihilism is for people who say, it's all going to hell, and, and I can't do anything about it. Versus the ELS, which says, and demonstrably are right, that it is all going to hell, but we're going to do something about it. Right. So, so there's a difference there. Yeah, and, that, and that's essentially what I was trying to articulate, which was to say that our culture, right, <coughs> as a form of cultural nihilism, right, is sort of defining that as an area which in many ways prevents a kind of sense of human agency, right? So we're, so we're constantly in this situation, well, okay, what are my choices? They're going to, again, I'll use the National Forest example here, where they have a, a commentary period and we can go there and we get a three minute time response that we can say, this is a bad idea, and then I can write in, you know, I can write comments, which I've done this many times, so I know that I know the drill, right? And so I go through this drill and I, I know the drill is ultimately futile and I know it's a kind of dog and pony show. So what, what I'm saying is that's exactly what I'm saying, is that what 